We'll cover 1974 and 1975 with The Fifth Dimension in 74 and Johnny Mathis in 1975. Ape Summer, my attorney, set up a meeting for me with Clive Davis and Clive introduced me to The Fifth Dimension and it was up to them whether they wanted to hire me. One song was called Harlem, written by Bill Withers. Another was Hardcore Poetry, written by Dennis Lambert and Brian Potter. Another was No Love in the Room, written by McManus and Podrosky, my writers, and we had a couple of additional songs. The group loved the material, and we decided we would give it a go. One of the most interesting things about The Fifth Dimension is about how fair and democratic they are. Any song that's to be recorded is voted on by the five of them, their record producer and their musical director. So we decided what we'd record, and we uh, went to RCA Studio A, and uh, Ed Green was the primary drummer for the pop-leaning stuff, and James Gadsden was the drummer for a couple of the more R&B-leaning cuts, Crazy Spaces, which Billy Davis Jr. loved, and Harlem, the Bill Withers tune. So, okay, we went in, we cut these things, they came out great. During the process, Clive would call and would offer suggestions about how Marilyn should sing certain lines during the evening and what uh, harmonies we should reduce, etc. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Clive had us record The Best of My Love, The Eagles Hit. He also brought us an interesting piece of material, and I'm sorry to backtrack on this. Uh, he had an exclusive on a tune called I Honestly Love You. The condition of the exclusive was that if Olivia Newton-John didn't release it as a single, it was ours to record. Unfortunately, Olivia Newton-John released it as a single and it was a big hit record. But to hear Marilyn and the group rehearse this tune was absolutely spine tingling. She just nailed this thing and the harmonies behind her with the group were exceptional. We rehearsed all the songs in Chicago in a hotel conference room and had a blast. Another aside on this is that Darnell Pershing, my best friend and arranger, while in Chicago, confided in me that he had an incredible fear of black men with knives. I thought, oh my, well, okay, each to one's own. When we all gathered around a piano to rehearse the songs for the sessions, Ron Townsend sat down next to Darnell, whipped out a switchblade, opened it, and started cleaning his nails with it. Darnell almost had a cardiac arrest. Okay, so back to the recordings. We, we went in, the songs turned out great, and Clive had to decide what to release for the first single. Well, he took a major gamble. He, he chose Harlem, which is, in my opinion, the by far the most R&B thing The Fifth Dimension has ever recorded, and a real genre buster for them. It was such an extreme gamble and probably not a good choice. We were creatively excited that Clive could choose such an unusual piece for their first release with their new producer, me. Bones Howe had produced them successfully for years, and I had been brought in basically to add a more R&B feel or a little more contemporary pop feel than the middle-of-the-road-leaning tracks that uh, had been based around Marilyn McCoo's voice and her ballads. I was to bring a more up-tempo and a little, what would you call, a little more crossover feel. So Arista, formerly Bill, Clive changed the name of the record label, and The Fifth Dimension was the most successful artist on that label, four years. Clive formed Arista, released the single Harlem, which disc jockeys, some disc jockeys, returned broken in half. The 45 was broken in half with notes saying, this is not The Fifth Dimension. Well, no kidding, it was a real stretch. It was a real experiment. So instantly, Clive released No Love in the Room, written by my writers, McManus and Podrosky. Part of the interesting thing about The Fifth Dimension is that they said, okay, you record one of our songs, which was Crazy Spaces, and we'll split the publishing with you. If we record No Love in the Room, you split the publishing with us. This was amazing to have such ego-free, fair and honest dealings with acts. So Clive released No Love in the Room, it began 
jetting up the charts with bullets, they call that when a record is moving sharply up the Billboard charts, and the others, Cashbox and Record World. So one evening, Carol, my wife and I, went out with Holly Smith and Howard Kalmanson, our friends. Howard Kalmanson was head of probably the largest and most influential radio program consultant business in the nation. He turned to me at dinner and said, John, I don't know what's going on. Our stations aren't playing No Love in the Room, and frankly, it sounds like a big hit record to me. Would you mind if I made a few calls and find out what's going on? I said, sure, Howard, I'd really appreciate that. So the next morning, I'm awakened by Howard calling me and saying, are you sitting down? And I said, why should I be? And Howard said, yeah, I think so. It seems that your group doesn't get along very well with Clive Davis, and you're not particularly amenable either, but most of Clive's acts kind of kiss ass with him and the fifth dimension, and you don't do that. So, behind the scenes, Clive has pulled the single, No Love in the Room, from radio and the stores, pulled the album that it was on from the stores, and has released the group from their contract, though they don't know it yet. Well, I was shocked. I called the Fifth Dimension, told them, asked them to confirm it, and they called back and said, yes, we're without a record deal. And they had a hit record moving up the charts when Clive pulled the plug. This essentially ended the Fifth Dimension's career, and mine was pretty close behind that. I just had a couple more shots at it, or I would be in trouble too. Then I received a call from the Fifth Dimension saying, John, we know that we promised you the production rights to our next project. We are thrilled with your work, and boy, I was thrilled with them. But we can't honor our promise because the only label that will take us is ABC Dunhill, and they insist that Jim Webb, who wrote many of their early hits for them, be the producer, and we're stuck. We can't honor our pledge to you. In return for not honoring our pledge, we will return the half publishing that we own with you on No Love in the Room. This is fabulous ethical behavior. I was totally unaccustomed to that in the record business. So let's move to Johnny Mathis. Darnell Pershing, my best friend, had arranged 12 Johnny Mathis albums prior to my getting involved. And I had been given Johnny based on a session I did for Columbia Records on Ronnie Dyson. Not one of my best efforts, that singles deal with Ronnie Dyson. Anyway, John Mathis and I sat down to choose material and actually found out that 90% of it was pre-assigned by the New York office of Columbia. John's primary audience at the time was the middle of the road market with cover songs, songs that had previously been successful hits for other artists. So we got to choose a couple more, one of which was Tom Bell and Linda Creed's You're As Right As Rain. The other song that came out great was Nice To Be Around, You Are So Nice To Be Around, written by Paul Williams, and we recorded a bunch of Paul Williams songs on this album. Paul and I were musical acquaintances over the years. So the Johnny Mathis album comes out. It does just great internationally in terms of album sales. I wasn't used to album sales, so I made about as much money off of a no-hit Johnny Mathis album as I did on my big hit record, Rock the Boat which sold four million singles worldwide and virtually no albums. In New York, my boss at CBS, Bruce Lundvall, promised I could produce John's next album, but that promise wasn't honored. That's okay. But I do remember Clive Davis pulling me aside and saying, you know, Richard Perry made a very smart move when I was at Columbia, John. I offered him, and I believe this is correct, uh, Percy Faith, Johnny Mathis, Vicky Carr, and he turned it down because, rightfully so, he wanted big hit records. And I thought, oh my God, and I even said to Clive, I would have taken that deal in a heartbeat. And he said, John, that would be really stupid. Those are just middle of the road artists. Well, here's the deal. These were big selling album, middle of the road artists, which though they paled in sales figures to rock artists, were just steady winners and and this was a big one for me. All of them were professionals that would show up on time, drug and alcohol free, do their work, attend rehearsals, and make an album in a month. 
Now let's think about all the rock albums that took six months and a year to produce. This would have been not just a money machine for me, but the easiest production work in the world. Remember, I was a line producer, which means get in the studio and out of the studio as quickly as you can. And if you have professionals like these middle of the road artists, that's exactly what you're gonna do. And the compensation would be excellent. Nothing compared to what the rock producers were making on their big hit acts, but more than enough for my wife and me to live on. Thank you very much. During the same period of time, Clive sent me a couple of artists to consider, one of whom was Melissa Manchester, who flew into Los Angeles, went to Darnell's house, we sat around a piano, and she said, John, I like to take about six months to produce an album. We spend a lot of time, a lot of late nights in the studio, and I thought, not for me. And I told her, I said, I don't think we're a match. I like to get in, I like to get out. That project she had was her Midnight Blue album, which Vinnie Poncia, I believe, produced and had the big hit record, Midnight Blue. I don't regret that decision to not work with Melissa Manchester at all. I honored myself. The other act I did accept from Clive was Eric Anderson, fabulous singer-songwriter, and I should have known better. As I've mentioned before, I don't know how to produce that kind of act. I experimented, I brought in Neil Diamond's rhythm section and I thought that would be sufficient. It wasn't. It's really amazing what some producers have a feel for and what they don't. And the great producers can do anything, I truly believe, but I couldn't. This is an area that Lenny Warnocker owned, in my opinion. He was the best. Okay, so with No Love in the Room and The Fifth Dimension not happening at Arista and The Fifth losing their record deal, and Johnny Mathis not being a viable act for me to obtain other work in the record industry because he was so middle of the road, now I was at a career crisis. Remember, none of my independent productions had really gone big other than a medium hit with Baby Hang Up the Phone. Now I needed to make a change. And in 12-step programs, making a change can sometimes be called a geographic, which is precisely what Carol and I did. More about that in the next chapter. Should I say that it's a blue?